Hello, students, and welcome to my screencast on ecosystem interactions in energy. This is instructional segment one in the California Living Earth in GSS. We're using those standards here at TASM. Uh, TASM stands for the American International School of Muscat. I hope that uh, all of your students are doing well, and this is to help prepare you for that first quiz. Uh, like all my videos, this is not for profit. This is only meant to help students, uh, so please do not uh, sell it or use it for anything. Uh, I try to use all freely reproducible images such as Khan Academy ones that are available on KhanAcademy.org or OpenStax. And if you find any images that weren't freely available, let me know and I will change them. Let's jump in. So a little joke for you. I got this from another teacher a long time ago. Bio equals life. Life equals wow. So bio equals wow. So let's have some wow times together. Let's have some fun. All right, we started much of this unit, um, or we spent much of this unit trying to explain what happened to the African buffalo population size in the Serengeti between these years. I told you a story of how after I got married, I went to uh, Namibia where my sister was doing Peace Corps. We went to Etosha National Park, and it was just awesome seeing the amazing biodiversity in Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> so what happened? And we're still actually explaining this if you're watching this early enough. Of why did the buffalo boom and then why did they crash back down? And so I hope you enjoyed using biological principles to explain this phenomenon. So let's go to another phenomenon we explained or another experiment we looked at, and that's Robert Payne's starfish experiment. Um, and you all did all the HHMI activities with this, and I think you really enjoyed it. So refresh yourself. What was the independent variable in Robert Payne's experiment? What was the dependent variable? What were some of the things that were controlled or constant? What was the control group? Pause the video and see if you can remember. Hopefully you remember that the independent variable was the removal of the starfish. So he said that he got thrown a long ways like a Frisbee. All right? The dependent variable was what happened to the biodiversity in those tidal pools. Once you remove the starfish, did the biodiversity go up or go down or stay the same? And by biodiversity, we mean the number of species in that tide pool. What were some, some things that would have to be controlled in this experiment? This one doesn't have a ton of controlled variables. Um, for instance, if we we're doing like heart rate and music, you know, we'd want the same volume on every song and the same time of day to measure heart rate. Here, I can't really think of too many controlled variables except for maybe using the same method of counting biodiversity. There's different diversity indexes or uh, maybe looking at the same time of day um, when counting the species. And so the control group, this is a group that's left alone, and it usually serves as a standard for comparison. And the control group here would be tidal pools where the starfish were left in. So we're going to compare the results of the tidal pools with the starfish versus the ones where they got thrown out. And so what did he find? Um, the independent variable before when he removed the starfish, well, he found that the diversity went down. Right? It's interesting. The starfish eat a bunch of stuff. So you would think, oh, if you get rid of the, the, the apex predator, you get rid of the one that's eating everything, that everything else should flourish and do well. But it's not the case. When he got rid of the starfish, after five years, he just became a monoculture. Just mussels were left. So in other words, without the starfish controlling some of the other species, the mussels were able to take over. And from that, he coined the term a keystone species. Here, this would be like a good graph to look at. And so you did that in some of your HHMI activities. So here with the starfish, the control group, you can see the number of species hovers around between 17 and 20. And here without the starfish, the experimental group, you see it drastically decreases to one or two. So just like in an arch, if you remove the keystone, the whole arch comes crumbling down. All right. Think about your own experiments. So when we get back together in hybrid mode or whenever I can see you, we'll do some real experiments in class. Um, so far, we've been doing virtual ones and simulations. What would be an experiment on bean germination, right? As we go into unit two in the California NGSS, it'll be about photosynthesis and cell respiration, the movement of carbon between reservoirs. So how would this work? What would be an independent variable, dependent variable, constants and controls? You think about that, and then we can talk about it as a class. Okay, I'm going a little out of order in what we did in class, but it's fine because it all comes together. Uh, this would be a biogeochemical cycle. Bio meaning life, geo meaning the earth, and chemical meaning nutrients, things like water, uh, carbon, uh, nitrogen, and phosphorus that move around. 
Uh, you're probably pretty familiar with the water cycle, but we tried to introduce a couple of new terms and talk a little bit about what's really going on here in different parts. I'm back. I had to get my water kits. So we use the, well, I use the water kits to kind of show that here are a bunch of water molecules. Water molecules are H2O, so two hydrogens and one oxygen. You can see these two hydro, or these two water molecules are sticking together. That is called cohesion. That is due to the oxygen atom, the red one, being negatively charged, whereas the white atoms, the hydrogens, are positively charged. That's because oxygen is a more electronegative element, and the bond within these atoms is called a covalent bond, and the electrons are more often on the uh, oxygen atom. So it's negative, and these would be positive. Negatives and positives are attracted, just like north and south poles. Opposites attract, so the water molecules actually attracted to each other, which is a really important property, because when you get many of them together, it gives you the emergent property of hydrogen bonding. We'll go over more of that in unit two. That will not be on your uh, assessment, but that was just a quick reminder. So as water is in its liquid form, it's constantly breaking and reforming these hydrogen bonds between water molecules. And as enough energy comes and shines down on the water in the form of sunlight, water can evaporate and a water molecule can move off. These water molecules can condense in clouds and come down as precipitation. Runoff is important. Right? Some of the water will percolate through the ground and into an aquifer, but some of it won't percolate, especially if it's on a parking lot or on rocks and it's unable to. And it may run off into a stream or a creek and then go to a river and either back out to the ocean or into a lake. This runoff, if it goes over a parking lot or places where there's been a lot of human activity, can gain pollution, it can pollute our waterways and our uh, lakes and rivers. Here, we are drastically draining these underground aquifers at a rate that's unsustainable. I was just listening to a New York Times podcast on it this morning when I was doing my run on uh, the ramifications of emptying these aquifers in the U.S. and all over the place. Trees naturally take water up and they get them all the way to their leaves. It's through a process called transpiration. If my hair, which is out of control is a leaf and the water is going up the tree to it. When it reaches the stomata or a hole in the leaf, water can evaporate out. And because water likes itself and bonds to itself, it can pull the next one up in the chain. And that is called transpiration. So these are some of the important parts of the water cycle. The water cycle is the first thing we, do, we did because it drives the other cycles. Right? What, uh, carbon dioxide can dissolve in the oceans. It's a huge ocean reservoir. And um, water can move around nitrogen and phosphorus. Here's the carbon cycle. So we won't spend too much time on this one. We actually haven't gotten to it if you're watching this video early. But we'll talk about reservoirs. Where can carbon stay and where can it uh, move around to? And there's a biological carbon cycle and a geological carbon cycle. Uh, but basically, what should we look at here is that carbon can be in the air. It's in the air in the form of carbon dioxide. That forms the greenhouse effect, which keeps us warm. Too much carbon dioxide in the air warms us up too much. Carbon dioxide can get out of the air by being absorbed by plants in a process called photosynthesis, where plants take carbon dioxide and water and make it into sugars. It can also be absorbed in the oceans. Um, carbon dioxide is given off by organisms when we respire. So right now or this morning when I was running, I was breathing out carbon dioxide. Um, you're breathing out carbon dioxide but also in a big way through human emissions, through plants, power plants, coal plants, uh, things burning fossil fuels um, through our cars, et cetera. Uh, and one big problem here is that we're tapping into reservoirs of carbon inside of soil and fossil fuels where it was trapped, and now we're releasing it from those reservoirs into the air. So we're dramatically influencing as humans this carbon cycle. Here's an example of it. So your CO2 concentration over time. This varies with something called the Milankovitch cycles, which is how Earth orbits around the sun and uh, variations in solar activity. If you'd like to learn more about that, I encourage you to take my environmental science class. But the important part of this graph is you can see the dramatic increase from 275 parts per million CO2 concentration to today, the, when I'm recording this video on September 24, 2020, or actually, excuse me, September 28th, this is uh, from a little bit earlier when it's making the slides, 411 parts per million. So that's a dramatic increase. This is uh, from the Keeling curve, which is a very famous measurement of CO2 concentration.
All right, the nitrogen cycle is a little more complicated. Um, I hope you enjoyed the activity we did with the Serengeti with the plants um, from Dr. Pringle. And we talked about uh, you drew cards and you try to see how it would get nitrogen, et cetera. But it showed a symbiotic relationship between plants and bacteria. There's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, more than there is oxygen. Uh, but this nitrogen isn't usable. It has to be fixed by bacteria for plants to use. Um, and then plants can use them, and then we can eat plants, or we eat animals that ate plants, and we can get nitrogen. Why is nitrogen important to us? It's important to us because it's a key component in proteins and in DNA. DNA has nitrogenous bases, and those sequences of those bases make us who we are. And proteins is what you're uh, seeing when you're looking at my face right now. Right? We're made of um, a ton of proteins, and proteins all have a nitrogen backbone as well. Now, the interesting thing is that once again, humans are influencing this, right? Humans have learned how to fix nitrogen into a usable form in making fertilizer. And so we are dramatically increasing the amount of nitrogen inside of the cycle. And that is leading to what's called eutrophication. So nitrogen is often a limiting nutrient in the system. What does this uh, statement mean? What are the implications for fertilizer runoff the streams, lakes, and the ocean? You did a little research on this. Why don't you pause the video and see what you can remember? And here it is. Here is a eutrophied body of water with lots of algae on top of it. So what's going on here? There's been an influx of nitrogen and phosphorus. So I think my next slide, yes. Can you describe the stages of eutrophication? Go ahead and pause the video. All right. There was an influx of nitrogen and phosphorus via fertilizers. These influxes cause an increase in algae and plant growth. That algae covers up the pond and actually kills the plants underneath it because they can't get any sunlight. The algae themselves also start to die because they run out of nitrogen and phosphorus eventually and because they reproduce so rapidly. As the algae and plants start to decay, they are eaten by bacteria, and these bacteria use up the oxygen in the water. Oxygen that's in the water that's usable by um, fish is called dissolved oxygen. I find that in the past, some students think that fish uh, could breathe the oxygen on this water molecule, and they can't. Right? This water molecule is not going to change. It's covalently bonded. It's very strong. There's oxygen dissolved within the lake that the fish use, and so when the oxygen gets used up by the bacteria to decay this, and we'll go over how oxygen plays a role in um, energy later on in unit two, then the water becomes hypoxic. And hypoxic means lacking oxygen. When it lacks oxygen, it can lead to fish kills. And there was actually a nasty fish kill last year here in Muscat, Oman. So this is a paper from Salt and Caboose University and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. And it went over some of these harmful algal blooms or eutrophication events in Omani waters. And you can see that they've happened all over um, the country that we're in. And so it's really tough and something that we should avoid. All right, those are the biogeochemical cycles. Those cycles of nutrients constantly flow around, right? This nitrogen will constantly be flowing around. So the Carbon inside of you might have been inside of a dinosaur at some time, is what I kept saying in class. Whereas nutrients cycle, energy does not. Energy is transferred through a food chain. So what, pause the video and see if you can answer all these questions. And see if you can remember what we went over in class. Well, here we go. Here's an example of a food chain. Here is a producer. It's going to be a plankton. I think it's covered up on my tools down there. The mollusks eat that, and then it's eaten by a, a fish, which is eaten by a bigger fish, right? Primary producers, consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. Only 10% of the energy is transferred each level. And why is that? Hmm. It's mainly lost as heat. It's also lost as uh, um, the organism moves around and reproduces and does other things. And so it's not all stored in fat or muscle for the next uh, organism to eat. They're doing stuff. So here's a picture of it. So here would be the plant eaten by the caterpillar. And let's say the caterpillar takes in 200 joules of energy. Well, 100 of it's just going to get pooped out and not used. 
Um, and there's some good questions in class about how much is just pooped out and not used, and that's interesting. Um, and it'd be different for different organs. Uh, 67 joules of this energy is going to be used by the caterpillar to do cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the process of converting food into energy that the body can use, and that energy is in the form of what's called ATP. So only 33 joules, which is about 10% of 200, is going to be used. It's a little more than that. Is going to be used to grow and make new biomass. Biomass meaning uh, muscle and fat inside of this caterpillar. That biomass is what can be eaten by the bird or whatever eats the caterpillar. And so only 10% is passed on to the next level. So there's some uh, implications of energy transfer between uh, levels being only 10% efficient. And the biggest implication is that food chains are limited in the number of levels that they can have. It's hard to think of a food chain that has more than six levels. If you can, it's probably uh, marine because there can be a few more levels there. There's another implication of should you be a vegetarian, right? If it takes that much energy to grow meat just for us to eat as humans, would the world be better off if we remove meat and instead grew crops and we can get more than enough nutrition and protein from eating uh various fruits and vegetables. And so I would encourage you to think about that and I'd encourage you to think about going vegetarian. All right, so many food chains put together make a food web. A food chain would be linear, whereas a food web would have many of them. Can you describe the two types of food webs, green food webs and brown food webs? Well, the green food web here starts with grass and it's probably the one that you learned as a uh, middle school student or as an elementary school student. Grass feeds the grasshopper, which feeds the coyote. I don't know if coyotes actually eat grasshoppers, but that's interesting, right? But the brown food web starts with detritus or with dead or decaying matter. And this dead or decaying matter is then eaten by decomposers. And those decomposers either die or they can be eaten by something else. And when they're eaten by something else, they're starting to pass along the energy. So think about all the plants that you see outside. Not all of them are going to be eaten. In fact, 90% of them are just going to end up dying and falling to the ground. But they can start whole food webs here. The important thing that you remember is that they're interconnected. And the brown food web and the green food web are interconnected between us. And so we as humans eat things that come from the brown food web as well. And I love mushrooms because I'm a fun guy. Dad joke. Okay. Can you describe a trophic cascade? And you all did a really good job on this in class. Um, and we did a couple of quick and learn activities on it. So can you pause the video and see if you can uh, figure out what's going on with the kelp forest and the lake? All right, here the kelp forest, these otters are going to eat the urchins, so that it's going to decrease the number of urchins. The urchins are going to eat the kelp, so it's going to decrease the number of kelp. Notice how this is not a food chain represented here. A food chain would represent the arrows going in the direction of energy transfer. This is a trophic cascade diagram, and I will not trick you that on the quiz, I promise you. So let's think about this. If urchins goes down, then, um, or if the urchins hurt the kelp. So if the otters decrease the number of urchins, what's gonna happen to the kelp? Well, you probably remember from the movie that it's gonna go up, right? The otters help the kelp. Even if the otters don't go around and tend to kelp or do anything to it, they help the number of kelp increase because they control the number of urchins which eat the kelp. Let's look at this lake. It adds us another level. So here, this bass is going to decrease the number of this fish, which is going to decrease the number of, I believe that's a daphnia. Daphnia decreased the number of algae. So if you take it here, let's think about what's going to happen. What's the effect of this bass on these algae? Well, here, down. So this is going to go up. So that's going to go down. So the overall impact would be a decrease in the number of these algae. Um, some of you brought up in class that there could be competing trophic cascades or there could be different uh, intensities of the trophic cascade and that's absolutely true. But what we saw in the movie and what we saw in the work associated with it is that oftentimes removing apex predators or removing keystone species causes a trophic cascade. Okay. Can you compare and contrast exponential and logistic growth? Can an elephant show exponential growth? Go ahead and pause the video and see what you remember. Hopefully you remember that exponential growth is a J-shaped curve. It's just showing 
um, you know, like X squared, like you've done in your math class. Whereas um, logistic growth is an S-shaped curve and it's going to level off at some area of carrying capacity. We were trying to figure out the carrying capacity of the buffalo. And then we did a lab online where you used uh, Mr. Darko's simulation to figure out the carrying capacity of the white-footed mouse. Everything can grow exponentially, but everything is eventually constrained by resources and to pause at some carrying capacity. Carrying capacity itself fluctuates depending upon the environment, and what can, uh, how many organisms can be supported by the environment. And humans do a lot of that fluctuation of affecting carrying capacity. Here's a picture of your simulation you did, and you did a great job on that. So can you compare and contrast R and K-selected species? We did not do this too much in class, but just um, to know that, that one's not better than the other. It's just a method or a, a way of reproducing and trying to continue on a species. So R-selected species would be something like flies, and they would have a short lifespan. They would have um, a short time to reproductive event. They would have a lot of babies, and they probably don't give um, you know, a lot of parental care to those babies. They're just trying to have as many as possible to make it so that way they can uh, grow up and carry on the species. Whereas case selected would be the opposite. This would be like humans. So you can look through this table here. All right, so I said that um, carrying capacity, the number of organisms in a species that the environment can support is influenced by different uh, factors. And so can you describe two of these factors? Can you describe density dependent and density independent factors that affect carrying capacity? Hopefully you got density dependent depends upon the population size. So it might be things like predation or disease or competition between them, food or water or space. And so if you have a lot of uh, the bats together um, and the bats are starting to spread disease amongst each other, that'd be a density dependent factor. Things that are density independent is like what's going on in the Western United States right now, these terrible fires and natural disasters and habitat destruction. All right, what's a niche or a niche? You can pronounce it either way. And can you describe the competitive exclusion principle? So we just went over that today, right? A niche is your job or role, your way of life in a habitat. So it's an ecological role or way of life, which is defined by the full set of conditions, resources, and interactions it needs. Now, if you have two species try and occupy the exact same niche, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is they're going to fight. Right? And one of them is going to go extinct. And this is a famous experiment showing the competitive exclusion principle by Dr. Gauss. So these uh, paramecium, they're growing in uh, petri dishes, but they occupy a very similar niche. And so when they're growing together, paramecium aurelia won out, whereas paramecium caught out and died out. It's interesting, too, because paramecium aurelia is actually smaller. Students tend to think that um, it's always the bigger species that wins, but here it's not the bigger. Notice how in the absence of each other, they both grow exponentially. They both grow absolutely fine. All right, what is your range of tolerance for learning in class? So if we're together, is the room too cold? Is it too crowded? Is it too hot, et cetera? Just a tolerance range is um, what, I believe these were, I had a picture of trout in your original one, right? What they can survive their niche in. And so these are abiotic factors. And these are things that are not alive. So A meaning without, so without life. So things like pH or temperature um, affecting where an organism can live, right? Biotic factors are things that are alive. And so that would be uh, other organisms like uh, predators or um, their food. Can you describe niche partitioning? And we watched a video clip with Dr. Pringle in the Serengeti with this. And he was studying how um, different uh, herbivores uh, partition areas. And so we, it's also called resource partitioning. And species just use part of their niche to avoid competition and they divide resources amongst them. So here, maybe the flamingo could eat up here where the uh, avocets are, but they're eating down here. And here, the ducks are eating here. Maybe they could eat up here, here, et cetera. But they've kind of divided the niche. And we did a cool little activity where you looked at uh, the Serengeti. You looked at these grass. And it's the same grass that you studied in the nutrient cycling. You saw that the zebras come along and eat it right after the rain. They kind of mow it down. And then the wildebeest come along. And then the gazelles come when it's at its lowest point. 
And the interesting thing here is that the competitive exclusion principle would tell us that these organisms cannot coexist in the exact same niche or the exact same area, but they figured out a way to partition the niche. And figuring out and giving them uh, these human characteristics is probably a disservice. Um, it's uh, a product of evolution in time. Okay, this we have not gone over if you're watching this video early, um, but fundamental niches versus realized niches. Here is uh, some barnacles. And Catholomus has a fundamental niche where it can live in high tide and low tide right here. But it's going to compete, compete with semi balanus semi balanus lives here and thrives better than Catholomus does. So Catholomus's realized niche is this part of the rock. That's where it can really live. That's how I'd remember a realized niche versus here is where it's fundamental niche to be covering this whole area. Just like you could go to any high school in Muscat, but you come here to tase them. So that'd be your realized niche. And, uh, and you could think about it in terms of your school schedule. Can you compare and contrast primary and secondary succession? You all had a lot of practice with this, with the Pogel and with the Bioman. Uh, interactive game, et cetera. But primary succession occurs when new land is formed, a bare rock is exposed. And then secondary succession follows the eruption of volcanoes or natural disasters. And we looked at uh, the PBS and how those purple plants were coming back afterwards. And here would be an example of wildfire secondary succession, which we're seeing happen right now in the Western US. <clears throat> this uh, we have not covered, but you've covered in middle school. Can you remember? Parasitism, mutualism, commensalism, and predation. So can you pair these up? So ticks eating your blood would be an example of a parasite. Mutualism, we all help each other. We all learn from each other. We're benefiting. Commensalism, one benefits while the other one doesn't. A barnacle benefits while the whale doesn't care. And predation is wolves are hunting elk. Predation and parasitism are often confused. You could say that the tick is preying on us as well, but I often think of a parasite as something living on something that hurts them. All right, we're almost done. Biodiversity, can you describe ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity, and how can you help promote biodiversity? All right, and we did this with a TED-Ed activity. So ecosystem diversity is the variety of ecosystems within a given region, and species diversity is the number of different species in a given ecosystem. We'll do an activity with the Simpsons Diversity Index later in the year when we come back uh, on the last instructional segment to ecosystems. And genetic diversity, we'll talk a lot about this with evolution, but the variety of genes within a given species. We said, you know, when um, the potato famine happened in Ireland, there wasn't a lot of genetic diversity there, and he was able to wipe out those potatoes. All right, and here's a picture of it. And last thing. Why should pregnant women not consume sushi? That really uh, hurt my wife because she really likes sushi when she was pregnant with our children. And can you explain biomagnification? If you're watching this early, we also haven't gotten to this yet, but we will. And biomagnification is how when a toxin is in the water, uh, such as DDT, uh, which Rachel Carson wrote about, or mercury, et cetera. It's then picked up by producers. Those producers are eaten by primary consumers, which are eaten by fish, which are eaten by larger fish. The problem is, is that these toxins cannot be broken down and they tend to reside in the fat, fat tissues or liver tissues and they sit there and they can't be broken down. So if they can't be broken down or excreted, they start to bioaccumulate as you go up the food chain. And so fish that have eaten Lots of other smaller fish, which have eaten these smaller producers, could have large levels of these toxins in their tissues, which is why they say not to eat sushi when they're pregnant. All right, students, that's my uh, review video for instructional segment one. I hope you found uh, some good stuff in there for you to review. Let me know if you have any questions and take care.